Where's the car and chocolate? Uh, it's in the mail. <laughs> I, I have a confession, Mike. I forgot to wish my wife a happy Valentine's Day this morning, too. Did you get it? Well, this, the loud slap you will hear this afternoon. Don't pay any attention to that. We should have put that on Facebook page. On what? Put it on Facebook page. See, that's why I don't do Facebook. All right. Let me invite you to open your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're, this is the second message on heaven. Relocation destination when we all get to heaven. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, today we thank you for being the God of all creation, the God of the universe. And I pray for this message time. Though we're small in numbers, Lord, we're strong in faith. And I pray that even through uh, the means of YouTube that you will reach the hearts of people. Lord, we love you. We trust you even during times of bad weather, during times of sickness like COVID, and during times of individual problems when we struggle, when we endure things we go through in this life lord and sometimes we wonder why but even in those times we trust you help our faith to increase bless now this time as we open your word in jesus name amen did you ever wonder if there will be pets in heaven you ever thought about that i think so you wonder you know why we know because in revelation 19 jesus is returning from heaven riding a white horse amen but I'm not sure that we're going to retain ownership of animals in heaven because they belong to God, not to us. Maybe all the animals will be like pets to us. I don't know. Uh, another popular question about heaven has been, what will we be doing in heaven? And we're going to address that a little bit more next week. But in this message today, we're going to talk about and answer the question, what happens when a person dies? You've probably never actually heard that question asked at a funeral, have you? because it's a little bit late for that person to do anything about it. There are a lot of theories, particularly four, about what happens when a person dies. And these four categories are, are the general ones that, that humanity uh, has uh, taken to. First of all, there is what's called materialism or atheism. Uh, game over. This basically states that, that when the body dies, that's the end of existence. Just like when a, a tree falls in the forest and it's died and it begins to rot and deteriorate, that's just the end of its existence. There's nothing beyond that. Uh, like the epitaph on a tombstone in England that said this, here lies an atheist, all dressed up with no place to go. The second theory is that of reincarnation. Now, if you know anything about the Eastern religions, some of those teach that the soul uh, survives after death, but it is reincarnated into another body. If the soul is only enlightened enough it is reincarnated into a higher life form. But if not, it regresses into a lower animal form. Mark Twain once said, I don't believe in reincarnation, and I didn't believe it in my former life either. <laughs> the third theory about what happens after death is the Platonic idea or theory of immortality. Plato suggested that the body is totally separate from the soul. And the body is bad, and the soul is good. And death, to these individuals that believe this, is the liberation of the soul from the body. After death, they believe that the soul lives on without a body for all of eternity. Now, I have to say this. It's unfortunate, it's very sad, that a lot of Christians unknowingly embrace this kind of, 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 of belief, the Platonic belief. But then the fourth theory which is taught in the Bible, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is called resurrection. At death, the soul and the spirit leave the body. But at a future date, the body will be raised and it will be changed and reunited with the soul and spirit. Now, that's the very broad belief. And in this message, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into those details. One of the best passages dealing with what happens when we die is found in what we're going to look at now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Let's look at that. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan. Amen to that, right? Longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, 
so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from him. You know, folks, even people uh, who call themselves Christians um, often have some strange ideas about what heaven is like. Uh, we get a lot of our misconceptions from Hollywood. Think about that. I love the movie, and you probably like it too, It's a Wonderful Life. How many times have you seen Wonderful Life? 10, 15, 20 times? You know, we, we watch it at least once every year around Christmas time. Of course, it stars uh, Jimmy Stewart. But the opening scene of that movie gives us a, a, a faulty understanding he of heaven. Frank Capra uh, opens the movie with several people praying for George Bailey, who is in trouble because some money is missing uh, from the savings and loan. And then the scene shifts to outer space where God is talking to an angel named Joseph and they summon an, an angel second class named Clarence to go to earth and to help out George Bailey. Well, Clarence is a man who had died in the 1800s, but he hasn't quite yet earned his wings, quote unquote. And in spite of the fact that he's not the brightest bulb in the socket, Clarence, who's played by a man by the name of Henry Travers, succeeds in getting George to reconsider that his life has been worth living. And at the end of this movie, as George Bailey is standing by the Christmas tree, there's a bell on the tree that rings. You, you know that scene. And the little girl says, Teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. And Jimmy Stewart, of course, smiles. And he says, That's right. And then he says, Attaboy, Clarence. Y'all all remember that. You could probably act that out. Well, that makes for a great movie, doesn't it? Real heart for, a heartwarming movie. But I have to tell you, it distorts what the Bible says happens when a person to a person when they die. When a person dies, they don't become an angel. A lot of times I read obituaries, and, 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 and I know the family is grieving, and I know they want to think the best of their family member. But so often I will read that says, God must have needed another angel in heaven because he took our loved one. Listen, folks, we don't become angels. Angels are created beings. Jesus said in, in Luke 16 that when Lazarus died, the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom, which is another way to describe paradise. Now, this morning, I want you to notice three things about what happens when a person dies, okay? Three things. Here's the first one. It really is an observation. This life is like sleeping in a tent, this life is like sleeping in a tent. How many of you have ever spent at least one night sleeping in a tent? Oh, wow. Just I believe everybody here has been sleeping in a tent. Tents were very popular uh, during the time that Paul wrote this letter. In fact, we learn in, in the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 3, that Paul worked as, as a tent maker. But unless you're really into camping, chances are you haven't spent a whole lot of time in a tent. You know, it's not real comfortable. You know, the, I, I used to could do it when I was little or as a kid, sleep on the ground. If I slept on the ground now, I don't know that I'd be able to get up off the ground. You'd be so stiff, or as my granddaddy used to say, stove up. That's a, that's a real phrase right there, stove up. But the main thing that, to understand is that a tent is a temporary dwelling compared to a building, which is relatively permanent. Your body is like a tent, and who you are really lives in the body. Got it? You and I are created in the image of God. That doesn't mean that we look like God. But just as God is triunity, in other words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you and I are triunity as well. What do you mean? We're body, soul, and spirit. L let me put it another way. You have a visible outward presence as well as an invisible inward presence. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So the outward person is your body, and the inward person is your soul and spirit. So the real you, the invisible you, lives within a body 
like a camper lives in a tent. When you look at me, all you can see really is the outer me, but there's also an inner me. That inner person is often called the ego or the personality or the soul of a person. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson, his favorite limic, limerick was this. He says, I know how ugly I are. I know my face ain't no star, but I don't mind it because I'm behind it. It's the others who get the jar. <laughs> and he's speaking, of course, the jar of clay. You know, that, that's what we see is the jar of clay. I want you to notice a, a couple of facts about you and about living and dying. Number one is your body wears out and you eventually die. We don't like to hear that, do we? It's coming. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it, but it's coming. Paul wrote about this tent being destroyed. That's a reference, of course, to death. It may be destroyed slowly by old age or by some disease. I see that every day uh, working as a hospice chaplain. I see what disease does to the human body. I see the, the gradual toll that it takes on people's lives. You could lose your life slowly over time, or it could be uh, lose it suddenly, like an automobile accident or uh, a soldier being shot. But we all have one thing in common, folks. This tent is not permanent. One day, we're going to move out of this tent. Everyone has to deal with the thought of death. We're all going to walk the Green Mile one of these days. It's going to happen. A pastor was trying to impress this idea upon his congregation one Sunday, and he was very emphatic about it. He said, one day, every member of this church is going to die. And there was a little boy there on the front row just started giggling and just started laughing and just thought it was hilarious. And the pastor repeated it. He said, I said, one day, every member of this church is going to die. Again, that little boy just laughed out loud, and that pastor got so irritated. He said, son, I want to know what's so funny about that. The little boy said, I'm not a member of this church. <laughs> I've read there's a tombstone in Georgia with an epitaph that says this. Remember, young man, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare, young man, to follow me. Well, someone added a note to that tombstone that said, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> That's good advice, isn't it? Now, here's the second thing about your life. Not only will your body wear out and eventually die, but your spirit endures forever. It's also true of your soul, but I believe your spirit is the innermost part of your personhood. C.S. Lewis once wrote, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. I love the way he put that, right? That's true. But the real essence of who we are is in our spirit. Now, granted, if you're having trouble distinguishing between your soul and your spirit, that's normal. That, that's one of those concepts that's hard to wrap your brain around. But look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. According to that passage, only the word of God can separate the soul and spirit. Go home and read that this afternoon. Before you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your spirit was dead. When you become a Christian, your spirit becomes alive through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. We spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of money, and we spend a lot of attention on our body. We go to the doctor, we get the COVID vaccine, we exercise, we try to eat healthily, we look in the mirror, we groom ourselves. We spend a lot of time on our earthly bodies. But Jesus said, what should it profit a man if he gain the whole world? but lose his own soul. Here's the great truth. While your tent is getting more and more feeble, it's possible that your spirit is getting more and more renewed. You know, folks, I've lived for six decades in this tent. Think about that. And every day, there seems to be a few more aches and pains. Yesterday, uh, our daughter and son-in-law, uh, we were down, I was down at their house, they're building a house, and I was helping them do some things down there. And they have a sloped driveway. And guess what was on it? Ice. And guess who didn't see it? Me. And guess who got hit when the ground flew up? <laughs> yeah, it was me. I understand about those initial, uh, uh, additional aches and pains. But I want to tell you something. I'm more excited about living for Jesus than I ever was before. You know, folks, as we see what's going on in our, co in our country, in our world, I'm becoming less and less attached to this place. I don't want to stay here forever. I'm, I better come to better understand one of the first courses I've ever learned. 
Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now, here's the second thing, okay? Number two, death is leaving this tent to be in the presence of Jesus or to be in paradise. The best description of the death of a Christian in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and it says this, away from the body and at home with the Lord. You know, most of us are familiar with the King James translation, which reads, absent from the body, present with the Lord. At the point of death, when you breathe your last breath, our body quits functioning. But our soul and our spirit immediately go to be with Jesus. Now, you've heard that all your life, but, but just hang on, okay? I want you to listen a little bit more to me. The word for death in the Hebrew language literally means to breathe out, to exhale. You know, the, the word pneumos is when God breathed into Adam, into his lungs, the breath of life. So at, there comes a point in time in our lives when we breathe out for the last time. It's our, like our English word expire. Bible says in John 19, verse 30, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. So a Christian should not fear death. One of my favorite descriptions of the godly woman from Proverbs 31. Any, any Proverbs 31 women here today? You ought to all raise your hand, okay? Okay. You know, one of the scriptures says that she can laugh at the days to come. Now, what does that say? You ain't worried about dying. You can laugh at that. Uh, working in, in hospice uh, gives me a chance to meet a lot of different people. And there was a patient we had at one time, strong Christian man, and had a tremendous sense of humor. And he'd already made plans for his funeral and his, the means of disposing of his body. He planned to be cremated. And this fellow had such a great sense of humor. He said that before he died, he wanted to eat some popcorn kernels. <laughs> That's a man that can look at his own death with humor. You know, death is not a laughing matter. But, folks, you and I can inject a little humor into this somber atmosphere of death. There's an inscription on a, well, an inscription on a tombstone is called an epitaph. And through the years, I've, I've read some very humorous ones. Let me just share some of my favorites. There was a tombstone in Ripsford, England that says, Here lies Anna Wallace. The children of Israel wanted bread, and the Lord sent them manna. Old Clark Wallace wanted a wife, and the devil sent him Anna. <laughs> On a tombstone in Rodoso, New Mexico. Is that how you pronounce that? Rodoso? It says, here lies Johnny Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. <laughs> On a tombstone in Richmond, Virginia. She always said her feet were killing her, but nobody believed her. And then one in Port Portland, Maine. Here lies my wife. I bid her goodbye. She rests in peace, and now so do I. And then my all-time favorite is from a tombstone in Nantucket, Massachusetts, because it really describes what happens to a Christian at death. Under the sod and under the trees lies the body of Jonathan Pease. But Pease isn't here. This is just the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. Doesn't that describe what, what happens when we as Christians die? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul wrote about a man in Christ who had ascended to paradise, the third heaven. And this man heard in inexpressible things that he was not permitted to tell others. Now, most biblical scholars believe that this man in Christ was Paul himself. Can you imagine what it would be like to catch a glimpse of heaven? You know, it, it would make things here on earth so mundane. When Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, he said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. You see, death is a departure of our soul and spirit to be with Jesus. And Paul used a triple superlative to describe it. He used the word better by far. But, but that phrase doesn't quite capture the thought. It should be translated like this. Much, much, much more better. That's not good grammar, but it's good theology. 
Death for a Christian is departing to be with Jesus. Later on, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, The time of my departure is at hand. Departure was a word used to describe a soldier who would break camp and fold up his tent to move on to another assignment. It was also used as a word to describe a prisoner who was being set free from their chains. So for a Christian, death is not ominous, folks. It's not scary. Uh, it, it, it's something that we can face with as much confidence as we have when we walk out of one room into another room. Dwight L. Moody was the Billy Graham of the 19th century. He led crusades in North America and, and, and England where thousands of people accepted Christ. Moody Church and Moody Bible Institute in Chicago were both named after Dwight L. Moody. Well, here's how he described his death. Someday you will read in the papers, D.L. Moody of the East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher that is all, out of this old clay tenement and into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit will live forever. Can you say amen right there? Amen, amen to that. Now, here's the third thing, okay? Number three. When Jesus returns, all believers will receive an eternal body like his. Now, I want you to put your thinking caps on here, okay? Well, we're, we're going to talk a lot about the second coming here. I hope that you get what I'm saying. Obviously, the answer to what happens when a person dies depends on whether or not that person knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. We've known that for, for decades as, as, as believers. This series on heaven is on heaven, but the Bible teaches also that those who die without a personal relationship with God through Christ will spend eternity separated from God. Now, that may not be politically correct, but that is exactly what the Bible teaches, and I will never make any apology for selling that. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus pulled back the veil from the afterlife, and he revealed what happened when two people died. There was a rich man whose name is not even given. Anonymous was his name. And there was a beggar who was called Lazarus. Lazarus died, and Jesus said that the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. There's another word, that's another word for, for paradise. Because for any good Jew, joining Abraham would be a heavenly experience. The rich man died and woke up in Hades. He was suffering. And to make matters worse, he could look into, the, into paradise and see Lazarus and Abraham. That's what Jesus said. The rich man cried out, Father Abraham, have Lazarus dip his finger in water and come and touch my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. So the rich man is still giving orders to Lazarus. How about that? Notice the rich man had a sense of body. He could see, he could recognize Lazarus, and he understood that Lazarus had a finger and he realized that he himself had a tongue. So he had the physical sense of suffering. Abraham responded. He said, no way, Jose. He said, there's a great gulf, chasm between us so that those who, aren't, who are here can't go to where you are. And why would they? And that those who are where you are can't come here. And they all would want to do that. The rich man's next request was this. Then please, please send Abraham to my, Lazarus to my house to warn my five brothers not to come to this place. Now, the rich man wasn't yet in hell. He was in Hades, which is hellish in nature. Revelation 20, bear with me, says that at the end of time, death and Hades will deliver up the dead in them. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That's what the Bible teaches. Hades, let me give you an example. Hades is kind of like the county jail before a prisoner is sentenced to the state penitentiary. Okay? It's still the same, same sensation. It's just the, the less of the permanent nature. Lazarus wasn't yet in the final heaven either. He was in paradise. That's what Jesus said. The current heaven. Paradise is like the waiting room for our final heaven. But it is heavenly in nature. Some call paradise pre-heaven or the intermediate state, but I, I prefer to call it paradise, exactly what Jesus called it. This is a point of confusion for a lot of Christians here. So let me try to explain. I'm going to use my dad as an example, okay? My dad died on Thanksgiving Day in 2005. He was 65 years old. 
He died of metastatic melanoma. After the Thanksgiving meal that day at about one o'clock and, and one nanosecond, his soul and spirit from his sick body left. It was a tattered tent, if you will. He woke up in paradise in the, in the presence of Jesus with a sense of a body that was whole and well. And like Lazarus and the rich man, he had a sense of a finger, he had a sense of a tongue, and he was aware of his surroundings. We took his corpse and buried it in Shiloh Cemetery. That's where his corpse has been for the last 15 years. It's still there. It's probably not in very good shape by, right now, but that's okay. Because there are other bodies, older bodies of Christians in worse conditions than his. Now think about this. Some Christians have been lost at sea. Others have been burned. Others have been eaten by wild animals. But folks, those believers are with Jesus in paradise right now. You know, it's, it's a, they have a sense of a, of a healthy body. And my dad is joyful. He is content in paradise. But he knows that the body he has now in paradise isn't his permanent heavenly body. Everybody with me? He knows one day that Jesus is going to return in the clouds to rapture the church. And when he comes, he's going to bring my dad. He's going to bring my mom. He's going to bring all the other saints with him. That's when they're going to get their resurrected bodies. Now listen carefully. The Bible says this. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Somebody say amen again. Amen. What will our resurrection body be like? It will be like the body of Jesus because the Bible says we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, right? For we shall see him as he is. Then... The resurrected saints and those who are alive in the return of Jesus will join Jesus in paradise. It gets even better, okay? Now, according to my understanding, I could spend weeks talking with you about this, but according to my understanding of Daniel and Revelation, we'll be there for seven years in paradise. And then when Jesus returns at the final battle of Jerusalem, we'll come with him. After this short battle, Jesus will win with the sword that comes from his mouth. In other words, he only has to speak victory, and it will happen. Then Jesus will rule and reign and, uh, on earth for a thousand years, and we'll be with him for that time. At the end of that thousand years, God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and it will be the greatest total makeover you have ever seen. And that's when the new Jerusalem will descend from heaven to earth. That's when we'll begin to experience the permanent heaven. Now, I know a lot of that. There's different interpretations of, uh, of the book of the Revelation, the book of Daniel. That's my particular belief of what's going to happen. Now, you may be thinking, wow, isn't that going to be tough on your dad? Isn't that going to be tough on my relatives, Christians who died, others in, in paradise right now, and they're, they're waiting for their resurrected bodies? Aren't they impatient? Aren't, isn't that bad? Not at all. I don't even think they have a sense of waiting for a long time. Not at all. When a believer dies and enters into paradise, time and space are meaningless. We are bound by time. We are bound by space here. But with God, you know, a, a thousand years is like a day. The day is like a thousand years. There are no clocks in paradise. What do you need a clock for in paradise? Time is irrelevant anymore. Did you notice as we were reading this text, the generation of Christians who are alive when Jesus returns actually won't die? Anybody want to be in that group? Sure, we all do. We will go straight to paradise without going through a cemetery. I say, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. That's what I'm looking for. Once you understand this, then 1 Corinthians 15 begins to make a whole lot more sense. The Bible says this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That's the dead. But we, the living, will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, that's the, the rapture, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we, that is the living again, will be changed. Wives, if you say your husband never changes, he will one day, I will promise you that. For the perishable, that's the dead, 
must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal, that's still us, the living, with immortality. What are we going to be like for eternity? Well, think about this. Mentally, you'll have a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. You ever struggle to remember something? Anybody ever done that? Sometimes I can't remember my name. Or maybe you search for the right word and you stutter trying to find it. You know, you're trying to think of that word. Listen, have you ever made a mistake and you just beat yourself up by saying, how can I be so dumb? Well, in heaven, we're going to be mentally perfect. So there's hope for some of us, all right? Finally, Paul said this, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Total knowledge. You know, we all have questions here on earth with no answers. Why is there COVID-19? Why is there cancer? Why do good people die young? Why are there tornadoes? Why are there, there earthquakes? Earthquakes? Why are there car accidents that, that kill children? Why are there was there divorce? We're not ever going to have the answers in this life. But when we meet Jesus, we're not even going to have to ask the questions because we're going to have total knowledge. We'll know even as we are known. Get this. Emotionally, you'll have a joyful heart. Think about that. You know, there are times in this life we, when we are ecstatically happy. And there are other times when we sink into the depths of despair. And our emotions are, are, can be a roller coaster alternating between the highs and the lows. There are times when we're angry. There are other times when we worry ourselves sick. But in heaven, folks, there will be none of those negative emotions. Think about that. There will be constant, pure joy. The Bible says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Isn't that a great thought? When we're in the presence of Jesus, the literal presence, we're going to be filled with joy all the time. Physically, and I alluded to this a moment ago, you'll have a body that will last for eternity. These bodies that hurt now, these bodies that wear out, these bodies that ache are going to be transformed into a body like Jesus after his resurrection. Think about this. When Jesus appeared in the upper room on that first Easter, the disciples were frightened. They thought he was a spirit. They thought he was a ghost. Jesus said this in Luke 24. Why are you troubled? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And then the Bible says, then he said, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Sounds to me like we're going to eat in heaven, doesn't it? It really does. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering, no more death. And the Bible, the Bible never says, how, however, how old we will be for eternity, chronologically speaking. But we will always be the perfect age for vitality and health in heaven. J. Oswald Sanders wrote this. We will have bodies fit for the full life of God to indwell and express itself forever. We will be able to eat, but will not need to. We will be able to move rapidly through space and matter. We will be ageless and not know pain, tears, sorrow, sickness, or death. We will have bodies of splendor. Let me ask you today, and if you're watching by YouTube, let me ask this. Where will you be five nanoseconds after you die? Some people may say, I don't care. But you will care five seconds after you die. Others answer, I don't know. How sad to not have the assurance of eternal life. But if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you can say with assurance, I'll be away from this body and at home with the Lord forever. Are you going to heaven? Do you know for sure? Would you bow your head with me this morning? For those here present today, for those watching by YouTube, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? You can know today, right now, this very moment, by trusting your faith in Jesus Christ. As Carl begins to play silently, I'm going to ask you, if you're not absolutely sure in your heart that you have a relationship with the King of Kings, I want to ask you to do something today. I want to ask you just to lift up your hand. Anyone here this morning, 
you're not absolutely certain of your relationship with Christ. Now for those watching on YouTube, if you don't know for certain today, you can make sure. Would you pray this prayer with me? I'm going to pray it verbally. You pray it in your heart. Dear Jesus, I do want to go to heaven. I want to make sure that when I die, I'm in your presence. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and to save me. So that when I leave this world, the next second, I'll be in your presence. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, do you mean that prayer? Would you reach out to us? Our website is newmarketbc.com. Reach out to us through our email. Let someone know we'd like to talk with you about your decision. My encouragement to you is to continue to grow in Christ. Because the day you're one day closer to heaven, to eternity, than you were this time yesterday. And one day, you're going to die. I'm going to die. All of us are going to die. And you're going to spend somewhere in eternity. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving us. And I thank you for providing a plan for us to be able to go to heaven. And that plan is through Jesus. I thank you for your word that teaches us, that encourages us, that corrects us, that exhorts us. And in this day and world in which we live, Lord, I pray that we, as your children, followers of Jesus Christ, would simply be found faithful, even to the end. We love you, and we pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus, and our Lord and Savior, and for his sake, amen. God bless you for tuning in today. God bless you for being here. May the Lord use you to be salt and light this week in our community. You're dismissed.